so. Oh, I never heard that before. Neither did I. Continue. Okay. So it is the August 12th meeting of the Board of Health. And pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access, access the meeting may do so by following the instructions on the Board of Health's posted agenda via Zoom, online, or the posted telephone number. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Board of Health website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of the proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. I will now open the Board of Health meeting with a roll call. So Steve George. Here. Maureen Malay. Here. Nancy Gilbert. Here. And our first item is to review and receive um, the minutes from July 8th. I did correct one spelling mistake before, hopefully okay. after sending them, but before we're proving them. <clears throat> it's the word develop on page three in the first paragraph. Develop is not like envelope. It doesn't have an E at the end. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the word envelop has an E, the, ver the verb. I don't know, but develop doesn't. That being said, um... Maureen, I don't have any other. No, I thought it was a heroic uh, set of minutes. Uh, that was quite well documented. I didn't have any questions about them. Okay, so may I have a motion to accept the minutes? I can move to accept the minutes of the meeting of July 8th. And Steve, will you second them? <laughs> yes, I'll second it, yeah. Okay, all in favor, Steve? Yes, aye. Maureen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay, due to the immediate urgent uh, business related to the recent surge of COVID-19 cases, especially due to the Delta variant, we'll be tabling some of, our, uh, uh, some of our items to our September meeting and focus on the public safety, including masks, testings, and vaccination. So for the Old business, Ed has, as inspector, has a um, report on um, Longmeadow Drive. Ed? You, are you tabling that or do you want me to no, give you No, I want brief? you to talk about oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, no, I'm not I tabling can, it. No, okay. I can uh, report in brief that acting as the agent of the board and following up on the concerns expressed by one of the ambulance crews. I uh, moved last Wednesday, I believe, last Thursday to do an emergency condemnation on an address, 66 Longmeadow Drive. The concern in short was that the house would not be ready for uh, their transport that night. Um, to return to, or their transport from some time earlier. Um, I'm trying to give you the, the gist of it without revealing anything sort of privileged medical information. But there were conditions in the house such that I did condemn the house for reasons of difficulty of egress and also for sanitation. And in one week and through the assistance of a number of people, especially Mary Beth Ogulowitz um, from the Senior Center, as well as some um, involved seniors and friends, and the hiring of a capable cleaner, especially to straighten out the house, I was able to lift the condemnation order today, a little after 10 a.m., and report that to the, the owner occupants attorney 
And so now that essentially is moot now. I made an action on your behalf and we were able to lift it before it even you had a chance to consider it. Okay. So it feels like success to me. I hope that does to you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It does. Thank you, Ed. Oh, you're welcome. And um, there's you no know, records to document this all, but I think the gist of it is that the address 66 Long Meadow Drive is now fully habitable and returned to that status. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's good. Thank you. And Jen, do you just wanna report on um, the tobacco fines uh, and how yeah. are that proceeding? Yeah, thanks so much. So following up on, on the tobacco fines, I believe that all the fines have been paid. I've received documentation from finance. So all of those are in, so I'm happy about that. And thank you to those people that paid them so promptly. The second thing we have on the agenda is the tobacco handler quiz. Was there anything about tobacco fines or is that what- No, just no. It, it was left that we didn't know um, what the status of them were at our last meeting. Yeah, yeah. So with the tobacco handler quiz, that was something that was brought up the last meeting. We sort of went back, um, I went back to sort of see what the process was and maybe it's sort of good that I knew and can sort of look at this, you know, with a, a, a different perspective. But I went and spoke to licensing and I said, you know, what is the process for people um, getting the license? Um, what uh, paperwork do they receive to fill out? And what is, uh, if you have a tobacco list item, you know, what numbers, how many things they have to do? What's the checklist? So when the tobacco people apply for the license, um, they're given a checklist. It does not include the tobacco handler quiz. So there are a few things I was thinking that this is a good time to really sort of relook at how we get the information to um, the businesses that there is a quiz. Um, I have the quiz up. I think we can review it. And then, then we, are at a point where we can really talk about working with these um, tobacco owners, the managers, about what's the best way to educate the people that sell um, tobacco products. Um, yes, there's a quiz, but once they take a quiz, what do you do with it? So I know Nancy, you and I had spoken. So one possibility is to, from our end here in the health department, you know, put together like maybe a prototype of you know, a policy and procedure about this is what we expect with a tobacco quiz. You know, we want you to keep a log and have it um, completed by everyone that takes a quiz. Right now, there's no process for us to go in and take a look at the qu uh, quizzes and to see if they're, they're up to date. So I think this is something that we can continue talking about. How do we help them make these right decisions and complete this information that's really valuable, um, you know, ultimately, right? So people don't uh, get, uh, we don't start new people smoking um, and, and into the hands of younger people. So I think that's where we are is just to take a real look at it now and go forward. So I think that's what I want to say. Thank you. I was poking around on the DPH website about tobacco sales, and there is also a, a video training about um, ID inspection for tobacco retailers. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, so there are some educate. I didn't look at it in detail, but it might be worth as we go forward looking at what other educational opportunities there are that might be available. Yeah, no, I think this is a really good idea um, to, to start really thinking about this. It's an opportunity to, to maybe do it with a fresh eye um, and something like that would be really compelling. Um, although it's surprising that I guess, I mean, the other thing I think Steve brought up the last time is I think with the difficulty hiring and turnover in some of these positions, it's 
it's a challenging thing to implement yeah. too, yeah. Um, right in this in this moment, especially. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it, most of these violators were also uh, alcohol sales uh, institutions, and so they should be quite skilled <laughs> at checking mm -hmm. IDs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. That should be a high priority. Yeah. So this is a, a really important thing, and I'd love to be able to give this some attention and, you know, draw people in on what's the best way of doing this. Look into what other some municipalities are doing. I like your idea, Maureen. Yeah. Steve, do you have any comments? No, that sounds good. I, I should absolutely do, really find out what we can do. And I think a lot of it is that they forget that if they, you know, they have their brother-in-law fill in for one day or something as a cashier, that they have to remember that that person has to have the same training for the uh, sales. Yeah. Right. And that's where we need to get that across. Yeah, I think we need to get that across, right? Yeah. Okay, so Jen, um, I know you've given this a lot of thought and I'm sure you'll come up with a good process to share with us um, and we can hear about it at our next meeting and okay. um, come up with that. Yeah, I'd love to work on that with you guys. All this great work, you know, let's have sort of the, the you know, the boots on the ground to be able to, to translate that out. So great. I'm Thank putting you. a little to-do box for me. Okay, I'm just going to skip down to the Amherst College Institutional Biosafety Committee. Um, we have a regulation and we got a letter from a faculty member at Amherst College. And um, so this is something pretty easy to address. Uh, do you mind giving us the overview, Jen? Yeah, so um, I spoke to, or I communicated with um, Dr. Alex Purdy um, at Amherst College. Um, she's um, uh, chair or works with the um, IBC, the Institutional Biosafety Committee um, there at Amherst College. And she had a question about recruiting members to their board. Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and state. I, the IBC must include members who reside within the town of Amherst. So she was stating that it was difficult recruiting community members who live within the town limits. And she's asking if we could, if she can um, bring in members from a broader number of towns. So wondering if we can make, um, I don't know if variance is the correct word, but something saying that she's allowed to um, include members who are in other towns that feed into the Amherst Public Schools, for example. Um, so I'm wondering if that means that we can expand where they can get the members from. So can we give her that ability to recruit from a larger geographical area? Yeah, you know, the, if you limit it to the schools, that's, you know, that doesn't include, you know, Northampton, Hadley, Belchertown, and so on. So I think, you know, the, what a lot of them do is a certain driving distance or some reasonable way to define where they can come from. I mean, if a person lived mm -hmm. in, you know, even, I don't know, where or something like that, and they were willing to able to come here, that that's okay with me. I mean, I don't see why the geographical location is that important. So I would just say within some kind of reasonable distance or driving distance, maybe within 25 yeah. miles or something. In the text that we got, it seemed like um, whoever regulates this in the federal level, I guess it is, has some rules about within an hour drive, or that was implied. Yes. But Amherst has separate rules in, in some kind of regulations that we have. I don't know them. I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. Yeah. That we might have to amend. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So we don't know exactly what they are at the moment. I don't have my hands on them. Um, I didn't look. <laughs> I used to be the chair of that committee for a while, but it was uh -huh. 30 years. It was 30 years ago. <laughs> and people thought if you did any gene cloning, you were going to cause a worldwide pandemic of some terrible disease. So, but now it's not quite so. It's 
most of the stuff that they do at Amherst College is very low level. But anyway, they yeah. need to follow the rules. <laughs> they so, do. Yes. Yeah. So we do have that. There's somewhere in the files deep down, there is a, there's that rule that was passed probably around 1978. And I don't think it's been changed since then. So we might want to just look, and I, I gather also that it's not an urgent question because she has been able to recruit the number of people she needs right now, but was concerned about it going forward. So yeah. um, we have some time to find it and, and amend it, I would think. So um, Jen, um, one clarification, is she able to find people who live in Amherst or do we need to uh, put on the future agenda, reviewing and revising the regulation, but giving a, uh, the, the best term would be a variance to allow her to recruit like within the county or within mm -hmm. one hour drive so that she can set this committee up now. Yeah. Yeah. It sounded like from what I read that she was all set right now, yeah. Yeah. but it had been difficult. So going forward, I think was the concern. Mm -hmm. um, just the second part of that, and it sort of feeds in what you're saying, Maureen, um, that the, once the members are identified, um, that the regulation stipulates that they need to request approval from the Board of Health for the external members. Right. Um, so there oh. are, is that right? Oh, okay. So there are three members um, that we can, I don't know if we need to do that. I don't we know should. if it's been done before in the past. We should so, do it, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So so I'm saying that there are three members, but I, I don't know if that completes the panel, Maureen. Um, if oh. down. I don't know. Do you know, Steve? If it's, I, th I think if I remember reading, I have it in your summary, but she said it's okay now it's, it's for the future oh sorry okay and i think i looked on the amherst college website and i think it's like two community members are required or something okay. so and one is typically a physician and one is typically mm -hmm. maybe a science teacher or someone else who's okay. knowledgeable okay so i have the three names here can i read them out loud and we okay now yes is that correct okay you can state so, their affiliations, say, Jen, say their affiliations too. To, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the external members would be David Burkham, MD. He's from Hampshire Gastroenterology Associates. The second one is Richard Rubin. He's an MD. He's a retired UMass staff physician. And Norman Price, a science teacher at the Amherst Regional Middle School. Do we approve? So I need a motion to approve these three members of the uh, Amherst College um, IBC committee. I'll I also, also move. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Maureen? Aye. Steve? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay. Now. The big piece for today's meeting is the public safety for this new phase of COVID-19 pandemic that we're entering, especially with the Delta virus. Um, and Jen has been doing a lot of work on this. So. Okay, yeah. So I just wanna start off with saying that um, I started August 2nd, I'm so happy to be the interim acting director again. So I did it back in August. So here I am again, and I'm just so honored to be working with Nancy and the rest of the folks. Um, and I'm saying that and sort of leading up to something that I've learned today, but the public safety, we started putting this on the agenda, I think, you know, less than two weeks ago. And at the time, we knew how urgent and important it was, but also I didn't um, explicitly write what was gonna be covered under the public safety for the next phase of COVID. Since then, things have really um, sort of gotten uh, more urgent, but what we're gonna discuss today are masks, um, vaccination and testing. So I've made some notes. So these are my notes. Um, because of the need to reduce the transmission of the COVID virus, both both the Delta 
and non-Delta variants. Uh, we're proposing some new mask guidance today and we'll get down into the weeds of it. Um, this is happening now because there are some concerning developments. Um, and I think I wanna go over what these developments are and what the area are. Um, some of the things that we'll be writing in or we're considering, um, as we all know, is the Delta variant is twice as contagious as the previous variant. The Delta uh, variant accounts for 85% of the positive cases in Massachusetts at this time. The Delta variant has been identified in four PCR positive cases in Amherst since July 17th. And I wanna say that that's what I'm aware of. Um, this data is from MAVEN, the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiological Network. And I looked today and there's four Delta variants. They do not sequence every positive case. I just wanna say that. So we don't actually know. I cannot speak for UMass, but I believe when they start testing or they're testing, will be sequenced everyone. So bravo to them if that is, if I'm relaying that accurately. Um, also, I want to say that we're looking at this today because of the increase in positive cases in surrounding communities. I'm going to get my notes. What I'm looking at is the CDC um, county tracker. If you look at Hampshire County, we're at moderate level now. South of us, we have high transmission to the west of us high, to the east towards Boston, it's substantial. So we're surrounded by higher, higher risk, um, higher communities of transmission, and it's just a matter of time until Delta is at our doorstep, and it already is, I think, as I noted. Um, I also want to go over the increased number of Amherst cases that are not Delta variant. So excuse me while I get my numbers. So the total number of cases since, boy, we all started this in January, February, March of 2020, we are at a total of 2,854. So I'm looking at number of new cases um, weekly what we've seen is it coming down from March, starting May and going through June, up to the third week or so in June, we had zero cases. Maybe there was one week with four cases. Starting the last week in June, we had one case. The first week in July, so July 1st to the 7th, zero. July 8th through the 14th, three cases. 15th through the 21st, three cases. July 22nd to the 28th, three cases. July 29th through August 4th, six cases. And July, August 5th through August 11th, 17 cases. So the last three weeks, we've seen three cases, 16 cases, 17 cases. So the numbers are on this trajectory of going up rapidly, so I feel this urgency with that metric. The other thing I want to say, a reason that we need um, some guidance is because I want to continue vaccination. You know, we're not where we were a year ago. Um, we have the vaccine. So the metrics are gonna be changing. We hope the numbers don't go up, they may, but I also like to see the rate of vaccination go up. And until that, we're gonna be monitoring. So the numbers I have for vaccination in Amherst, this number includes Pelham. It also may include um, residents that may have secondary residencies. So I'm saying this number, sort of telling you that I haven't completely vetted it, but from the mass DPH, we're at 40% fully vaccinated. Massachusetts is 64% fully vaccinated. I'm also looking from DPH stats. It says the number of fully vaccinated blacks per capita in Amherst is 25%. Hispanic, 28, while whites are 39%. So with all of these reasons, I think the next steps are to consider 
wearing masks. And that's where we are today. That's what's bringing us together. Um, do you want me to keep going? Are there any questions? Yes, uh, yes Steve or Maureen, do you have any questions? The, the one thing, Jen, to be aware of is that those mass uh, DPH data for Massachusetts kind of assumes that, you know, it says there's, according to the census, there's 41,000 people that live here. But as you know, many of them were not here this spring, uh, you know, probably around, you know, could be easily 12,000 students yeah, were you. not here. Mm -hmm. And so they may well have been vaccinated somewhere else. We would not know because they're listed here. And so that number of 40% is, you know, um, Emma had to deal with the DPH people all the time because they were getting after what's wrong with you guys What's wrong with you guys? those people were not here so there's no way they can show up as vaccinated in our town data, even though they probably are somewhere else. Yeah, no, thank you for this clarification, you know I understand these these numbers yeah. just need a lot of. Um, of, of back and forth, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I do know once you're vaccinated, it gets uploaded to the uh, Massachusetts system, the MIIS, and then it gets populated into Maven. So, but um, I hear what you're saying. Thank you, yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Jen, would you know if there's someone on our? I don't know how how this is tracked. Um, you know, if the person goes to give their vaccine and they're staying at home in in Worcester say, and the, but mm -hmm. they, so they give their home address, but there's, it wouldn't pounce back with a name that from a Hampshire County address, would it? I mean, that, would those ever connect, I guess? It's, it doesn't seem like they do. They yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to answer that. Yeah, right, so. Well right now. I know this is something that, you know, we, we've talked about and deal with is trying to right. de -du deduplicate, yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, so I know. Uh, quite a few of um, these numbers are related to UMass, and I know Jen has been working and in communication with UMass, so later on you can fill us in on what you've found out from, from UMass, because she's mm -hmm. developing a good partnership with them. Yeah, yeah, we definitely are, and you know, that's a goal of ours as well. You know, we've been um, reporting the numbers um, daily. And then I think for a few weeks, um, maybe three or four weeks, it was weekly, but we're starting back up with daily. So we'll get, get that going. Um, and then I'll be able to sort of brush up with UMass and get in sync. Okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate that correction. So, you know, so moving on, you know, we see that the next steps wearing a mask. We know University uh, UMass is doing this. The Amherst Regional Public Schools will be masking. Greenfield has an advisory. Northampton has in, in, instituted a mandate. So this is where I like to talk about our next steps. And what I'd like to propose is that Amherst um, move into, and I'm gonna need help from the board to, to help me with the, the wording, but I'd like to move into um, a mandatory wearing of face masks rather than an advisory. So um, I'm looking at the old mask um, mandate and I'm using as a template so what I'm thinking of wording is face masks or covering must be worn indoor public spaces and indoor private spaces open to the public. Now, I know what a serious step this is and there are a few things that I really like to sort of say maybe rapid fire and we'll come back to it if that's okay. So one thing I wanna do is really make sure that we know what our metrics are and there's an end date. And we'll, I think we'll go through this later. So something I wanna propose later on is, can we every two weeks revisit the data? Um, what is our metric gonna be? This is not gonna be a, just a blanket statement till the end of October. I'd really like to look and see that we're being data driven. Um, so that's something I'm throwing out there right now. Um, I like, like to also, let's see, um, I'm trying to think about what we need. So if we need a definition of indoor spaces, 
what would that be? Use the Northampton so, one. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. So restaurants, bars, indoor performance venues, hotels and motels, gyms, fitness clubs, salons, and places of worship. And Steve, I just want to, I sort of said that smiling because I have theirs in front of me. But you also looked at um, across the state and our neighbors, what they've done. And thank you, Nancy and everyone else that you've given them to me. And I can see the hard work that went into all of those. The definition, definition of a face mask or covering, I really like to put in words similar to Northampton's that face masks, now that we know, really need to be well-fitting. So whatever wording we have um, from Northampton, uh, they fit snugly. Um, the disposable surgical or procedure masks are, are good. Um, they can be, if they're cloth, uh, clean and multi uh, layers of fabric. Um, and that they allow for breathing. That sounds good. Okay, so I can work on that. Now here are the exceptions. So these are some good things. Thank you, all our partners. Um, so this order, exceptions, this order shall not apply. <clears throat> Persons seated at the restaurant table or seated at the bar if they're eating or drinking. Patrons standing at the bar or behind the bar need to be masked up. So I think that's an important distinction. You know, I want everyone to understand that. We still want you going into restaurants with your part, you know, with your parties and sitting and enjoying yourselves and not worry that someone's gonna uh, think you're, you're doing it wrong. If you're seated, then you can have your mask off while you're eating or drinking. That's my recommendation. So we can, I can hear what you have to say. Second exception, persons who masks would not be safe for. Um, so if there's a medical diagnosis. Five years or younger do not need to wear it. And performers, for example, if someone's singing or there's a woodwind or a, Peter, I see you have your hand up, we'll get to you. Um, people who are playing, and you can help me with the wording, a woodwind or a brass instrument should have a setback of 10 feet. So these things are gonna continue if, if it's agreed upon. We just need to make sure that everyone's safe and that setback is what's been used. Jen, maybe this would be a point if you, I, I can't see the screen and who else is here, but you know, even though we may not be required to have a public comment or really fulsome public comment, I hope we would do that, have a time right at this meeting for that. Yeah, I see, I see a yeah. hand up. Is this something we do now or at the end or? I, I, th I think after you yeah. present everything, right. then okay. we'll open it because I, then there might be a question that you already have the answer to. Okay, thank you. So initiation and rescinding of the order. Um, so what I'd like to do, so I'd like to get this going. I think there's urgency, but I like to work with the bid and the businesses and make sure this works well for them. So I just want to throw this out and then we'll talk about it. If we today, let's say uh, we agree to a mandate so a mandate and then we're going to have a press release and then we'll do an email to businesses i like to work with the bid and see what is good they have a good you know feeling of what would work so for example if we say yes we're going to do this would monday the 16th be a good time to start that for the businesses now i have um, access to face masks um, we have them in storage here we're able to get people going for a week's worth um, of masks. I also, I would um, ask um, somehow to work with the bid. Um, I don't know if we can help them financially to get those great signs that they had back up. They could be modified. Um, we did create um, a yellow sign sort of a, a, from the bid that we can distribute tomorrow if 
people want those yellow signs. So we're ready to sort of support the businesses with that. We're sending the order. So I don't know what kind of metric we want to look at, but I really like to look at this every two weeks and just make sure we're on track with this. Um, can we you know, talk about when the, the order is rescinded? Does it mean that we have two weeks of data with only two cases? Um, do we need you know, a, a more consistent trend to see it down? So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. Um, and then enforcement, I'm gonna have to ask the board to help me. Is this something that we would use the previous mass order um, enforcement and penalties for? I just need help with expertise. I'd like to be able to sort support the businesses that were there to help them with this um, if, if they want to enforce, I mean, when they enforce the mask mandate. Again, I think the Northampton one is very good. It says don't let you know people individual citizens should not be doing it just deal with it yourself and uh you know it's it, the language is very good there it doesn't involve the police in any way ever right, right. and we're not going to do that and so it just says this is what you need to do but it really leaves it largely up to the individuals and I, that language okay. in there seems very good and by the way that language in northampton i know was reviewed by their city solicitor Mm. So that is a very good thing that they have that I think the language is, you know, has, has been vetted for the legal aspects. And an important point that Jen is making is that we don't want to be punitive. Mm -hmm. We want people to do what's going to promote the public safety. Sure. And if we get into a punitive thing, that, that doesn't help. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think your point, Jen, about the metrics and uh, involving the business uh, district uh, bid to see how we can get um, compliance for safety. Mm -hmm. I think so some of our language in the previous uh, order about enforcement really stressed the education and support for wearing masks as opposed to the punitive aspects. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanna ask and tell me if this is correct, I'd like to ask the Board of Health um, if it's appropriate for you to give me the authority to do this um, as the acting director, is this something um, that you would uh, allow and, and recommend? Well, well, Jen, I think you as an agent um, are, are very valuable. Um, you've done a lot of research on this and that you would be up to metrics for the board to have to meet post an open meeting law and then meet to give you more directions would be counterproductive for public safety, public mm -hmm. health. Um, I don't know what other people yeah. feel, but we can give her as the agent, the ability agent. to do this. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's the proper term. Yeah, yeah. maybe Jet. Sorry, some, thing, some orders that I read seemed a little bit too on and off, I thought, you know, that was like, I think Provincetown was like five days oh, of the that. next trip yeah. of this will would, we would, you know, decrease the, make it an advisory or, and then if it was five days that went up, you would put it back on. Yeah. I feel like for businesses that would be hard and for people of uh, complying, that would be hard. So I think it has... Yeah. I think metrics are important, but we have to be, it can't be every other day. You know, it, it just has to have some consistency. That that was my only comment. Yes, no, I agree with you. Yeah. So that's where your data driven uh, making the decision. Also, I'm sure, um, and we'll open this up in a little while to the attendees. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of concern about when the students come back. That's what was a big concern last year. Um, the university is fully opening. That's why your partnership with them is so valuable, Jen. Um, and yeah. uh, as they start coming back, uh, the safety of, of, of all of them and us. Yeah. Jen, do you have any sense whether the state of Massachusetts might reinstitute their indoor mandate? 
I have not heard that on any DPH calls. Yeah. Yeah. You remember in terms of signs, you know, our previous one from the Amherst Health Department and Board of Health, that was for outdoor masking. So you want to really check those signs and make sure that there's no ambiguity there. Um, because they were not, it wasn't about indoor masking, that was about outdoor masking, which I think we are not considering. Right, this is indoor masking. This is indoor. Yeah. I think that was layered on top of the state order for right. indoor masking. Jen texted me, she's lost power. Oh, I hear some thunder oh, no. to the north. <laughs> oh no, oh no, oh, that's terrible. Uh, oh, I wonder if she can call in. I'll put, can you call you phone number? in? <laughs> oh dear. She won't be. She won't know about the the number because she doesn't have this computer. Well, we could tell her the number. It's um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. The number is 301-715-8592. There are so a whole lot of other ones, okay. but that's the first one. Oh, let me repeat it. 301-715-8592. Right. Yeah. Okay. Of course, if she has to let herself into the meeting, that won't work very well. Are you are you a co-host, Nancy? Yes, I am. Yeah, you should watch for that. Or so calls a panelist. Let me hope I can do this. Yeah, yeah. Attendees. I don't know where that shows up. One phone call listener. I don't know if that's her. Oh dear. Maybe I can just get her on my cell phone and she can talk into here. How do you think that would work? Oh, um, well. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna tell her I can call her and let her be in on speakerphone. Okay, I'm calling her. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you're back, Jen. Hi, this is Jennifer Brown. Oh, are you? Oops, wait a minute. We can't hear you. She's muted. Uh, let me see. Panelists. <laughs> well, now she's not. All are right. Back? Okay. Woo. Okay. It, there's like this little cell, thunder cell going over the Bang Center here in town. Oh, pretty dramatic. Yeah. Okay. Do we have anything else to talk about for masks? We're not what? talking about vaccines or um, testing before I open it up to the public. Jen, would it be feasible for you to send what the actual text that you're going to use to the board and just with you know 24 hours notice to just have a look at it before it goes public or I don't want to yes. delay it. Yeah. No, that's that's going to be what I do. Great, um, great. Yeah. And it would be very quick, just you know, 24 hours is all we would need. If, even if, yes, even so thank you. I definitely will. I appreciate it. Okay, good. That. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to open it up to the public and Peter Kent. Okay, Peter. Hi, Peter. Yes, hello. Peter. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you. So yeah, I'll be as brief and succinct as I can be. Um, my name is Peter and I'm a resident of Amherst. I'm also an employee at UMass. 
Um, so yeah, I'll just get straight to the point. First of all, I'm uh, in 100% agreeance as someone, of course, who lives in who lives in Amherst and who works at UMass and who's in the community. I'm in agreeance with the request for a mask mandate. Um, I think strongly we should have this indoor mask mandate put in place for the town. Um, I know we're not talking about. Yep, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Nancy, I don't have permission to record. Are we recording still? Oh, oh. yes, it says recording on mine. Okay, it, yeah, it on says mine. recording on mine too. Yes, that's fine. Peter, yeah. I'm sorry, Peter. Yeah. No, it's okay. No problem. Um, yeah, so I I'm, I agree 100% that we should have a, a mask mandate in place. Um, also to expand testing. I know we'll get to that later. Um, and also just as a quick note, also, I think that we should have a really high standard. Um, like as someone mentioned, I, you know, I, I don't think that would be productive to do something where we're going back and forth every five days, put masks on, take them off, right? And especially considering how serious the Delta variant is. You know, we need to have this man mask mandate put in place and then have a pretty robust and ambitious standard, right, for when, when it's actually time to rescind it. Uh, you know, whether or not that's based on vaccination rates, which I understand need to be much higher, right? Even if, uh, sorry, there's some thunder in the background. It's really yeah. loud. Um, yeah, but even if, you know, even if the vaccination rates, uh, I understand they're probably higher than 40%, right? But even if they're at 50 or 60, uh, you know, we still need to get it higher than that, right? Um, so just being really clear on what the metrics are and making the metrics, put, making them a high standard as well. And also communicating that clearly to people uh, simply, you know, people won't make accusations to say that these that mandate is arbitrary, but, you know, to be clear that this is that the Delta variant is a serious threat. Right. Um, you already talked about the Northampton Board of Health, so I won't bring up that since you already drawn upon that. Um, yeah. And then just the other point was, um, especially considering that rates are increasing around the uh, the county, the state and the nation, and then also that. Uh, of course, there's going to be a huge increase in the population of the town with uh, UMass students moving back in. I think we need to be as proactive as possible, right, instead of waiting for the rates to get higher, um, you know, to actually beat this, to, to try to beat this when we're ahead and be ambitious about it, right? Um, and then, you know, I, I, just a quick note from the Northampton Board of Health Director, I really liked what they said at the meeting a few days ago when they were saying by putting this in place right now, you know, we're preventing businesses or other people having to do more strict measures in the future, right? Because we're able to flatten the curve and get ahead of it now, right? Um, and then, you know, just as a quick comment about the effectiveness of masks, I was just uh, recently uh, referencing a uh, article from Nature from a biostatistician and uh, science journalist, Lynn People, uh, where she was summarizing studies uh, demonstrating from different sources that um, there was one source, for example, where they uh, were researchers estimated that this reduced the growth of COVID-19 by 2% per day. Of course, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's per day, right? So that's oh, a huge amount over time. Um, and they cautiously suggested that mandates might have averted as many as 450,000 cases across the U.S. if there was more widespread mask mandates that were put into place. So uh, clearly they work, right? Uh, it's a tool that we have at our disposal that's cheap and easy. Um, and I know people are probably eager to feel like things are back to normal, but we're just, right, we're just not there yet. We need to have more tools for protection that we need to get ahead of this and beat this, right? Um, so, you know, let's be proactive and let's make the town and the community a model um, for the country, too, to say that this is how you can actually beat COVID and control it, right? And let's put the work in now to, um, to go ahead and do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's made some good points. Mindy Dom has her hand raised. Okay, Mindy. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Mindy. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jen. Welcome into this new role. Um, I'm grateful for your accepting and I'm grateful for this Board of Health. I just want to first say to each of you, thank you so much for your thoughtful and really deliberate public service. I'm so proud um, to represent Amherst and I'm really proud to represent this Board of Health. Um, I just, I, um, I wanted just to express my agreement also with um, the initiative to have an indoor uh, mask mandate in Amherst right now. I think the timing is perfect, Jen. You had, you had um, talked about should it start on the 16th or when should it start? And I think um, in, in conversation with the bid and businesses and when they can roll it out, the sooner the better. Um, I think having it in place before students arrive is critical. 
Yes. Um, so that that's actually what um, the town is presenting when folks arrive. I also wanted to make sure that you knew, and I think you do, but I wanted to offer any assistance that um, you need from either the Department of Public Health or from the Baker administration to please feel free to reach out. I at least can uh, amplify and advocate um, uh, for what you need. Um, the population piece is a challenging one for Amherst. Our census um, denominator includes a whole lot of people that are not included when we talk about who has vaccine. So we're going to have to sort of figure out a way to address that. I know that um, I think when Emma was here, she was looking at ways to relook at the data, but I'm not sure if that was um, if if that was actually an appropriate way to do it, but I'm happy to work with the state to try to figure out how we can go about getting a more accurate number in terms of what percent mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. population is vaccinated, if that's something that you think would be helpful to you. Yeah, um, thank you. And I think the only other thing I wanted to say was, let me know what I can do to help and what I can do mm -hmm. to support, um, whether that's amplify messages, get information, um, get access to resources, I'm interested in hearing what's discussed in terms of vaccination and testing. And if you need more resources from the state to be able to do what you want to do in that regard, please, please um, reach out to me as a partner in this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mindy. Thank you, know, Mindy, you, Mindy. Some of the vaccine clinics that I've been to that you've been there, it makes a huge difference that personal interaction, that human touch. So I appreciate what you've done for us. So oh, thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The appreciation is definitely mutual. So nice. thanks. All right. Great. Okay. Are there any other hands up? Uh, yeah. A lot of the talk. So D. Cruiser, can you introduce yourself and? Hi. My name is Dakota. You're a little garbled for me. For me. Yes, you're garbled. Can't really hear, Dakota. Yeah, I can't hear you, Dakota. Uh, uh, I'm a resident outside of Amherst, but I'll be in Amherst tomorrow. I just want a clarification. Do you, do you hear me now? Yes. Do you hear me now? A little yes. Better. Do you hear me now? Intermittent. Intermittent. Yes. Do you hear me Speak now? Speak slowly. Speak slowly. Yes. All right. All right. Just to clarify. Just to clarify. Oh, so does the mandate tentatively start tomorrow or does it start the 16th? I was just wondering because I missed that part of the meeting. I think there's going to be a grace period. So it, it, if we're agreeing on the 16th, it, it wouldn't be until Monday. It wouldn't be until Monday. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was all my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for calling in. Yeah. Do any other attendees want to speak? Raise your hand. Okay. So we have support for the mask mandate. Now we have to do, how do we give Jen the permission and move forward here, our next step with, with this? Yeah, we, I think we can just make a general uh, a motion that doesn't have to refer to all the details because I went through everything that Jen said. I certainly agree with every point that was made. <clears throat> can we just say that as discussed or that's as, as outlined during the meeting that she would go ahead and prepare the text of, of the actual order? But we also have to give her the flexibility so that she can change things. So we'll have to give her permission as an agent to uh, develop the uh, mask regulation ordinance, whatever we're going to call it, and then um, to adjust it um, data-based and with her professional um, knowledge. So how are we going to yeah. work that? Work yeah. that. Because we don't want to have to be meeting every two weeks and then right, have to right. be posted. And by that time, we, we need to give Jen the ability to make the decisions and, and change them uh, according to, to data. Jen, do you have any idea? 
how can we support you? Oh, yes. So sorry if I didn't chime in. You know, I, I appreciate this. You know, I'll, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question, but, you know, I'd love to be able to draft this. I hear what we've been talking about. Um, I'll give it to you to okay. And then, um, you know, I, I certainly am not doing this alone. I have all these partners helping me here in the health department. Um, so, so if that's how you'd like me to proceed, um, it'll be a, a check-in in two weeks and then we'll be meeting in a month. That'll be um, a time that we can discuss the metrics, but we'll have had it in place for a month and I don't see any change. There won't be any change in the next month. Okay. So you don't something. anticipate a change in the next two weeks as to remove, it doesn't make, I would doubt that, that, yes. that things would get better between now and two weeks from now. Right, right. So here we're, we're data driven, but we're expecting residents to come in and things right. to, to amplify. And that trend of the numbers, you know, is just going up. Right. So I, I don't know if we're going to see such an increase. Are we going to see a surge, but maybe sooner than later? So I don't expect a difference. In yeah. yeah. And I agree. I think we're, we've been on the threshold of being considered a substantial risk of transmission for, a, for several days now, and we're going to be there. Yeah. Um, okay. So we don't need to deal with the metric part right now, it sounds no. like. No. 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 So let me just try this. Let me try this. Okay. So the Board of Health authorizes interim health director Jennifer Brown to develop and issue a mask order for indoor public spaces in the town of Amherst and to modify the order as needed. And if we just add Jennifer Brown as agent of the board. Okay. I don't know if you want to add also the statement that as discussed, you know, the parameters discussed in the meeting or something. I don't know if that's necessary. That's a good idea, I'll see. Yeah. Mindy, do you still have your hand up? Yeah. Yep, yeah. here she goes. I'm sorry, okay. that's a mistake. I'll lower it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it down? Yes. It is yes. Down. Yeah. So and so, uh, Maureen. So these we're referring to sort of to the. You want to say as discussed or as what? What do you what do you want to say about that? Um, outlined maybe. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So the, the um, <clears throat> board of health authorizes interim health director Jennifer Brown, acting as agent of the board, to develop and issue a mask order for indoor public spaces in the town of Amherst as, what did we say? As, outlined. As outlined uh, during, the, um, during the August 12th board meeting and to modify the order as needed. Uh, I move to say that. <laughs> So it's been moved and seconded. Any <laughs> other further discussion? Jen, do you do you feel comfortable with that wording? Yes, I do. I think, can I clarify something or is this something you want me to, to sorry, there's just more. More thunder. Yes. Um, so can, can I say that um, we're given a grace period and the mandate will go into effect Monday the 16th? We can say Have that. Have we agreed upon that? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Is, is that is that enough time, Jen, or do you need a, a few more another days? Another business day? <laughs> yes, like oh, like, another business. Day. Yes, I mean yes. Yeah. It's, it's Friday tomorrow. Do you need like next Wednesday? What what time frame do you need? Yeah, no, that sounds that I like to have a grace period where people understand this urgency. You know, thank you, Peter and Mindy, for talking about that, and let's get them helped, you know, we have some resources to get this up and going, but I'd like to see it before next weekend. Um, so do you want to say Wednesday? 
is is that a good time period for you? It would be uh, um, August 18th, or if you want August, August 18th, because then if people have questions, you're available to answer questions once it goes in. If we put it in on a Friday, there's no um, yeah, uh, ability you. to answer questions. Okay, so does the 18th sound good for the, the initiation? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I like that, thank you. Okay, so so I like that. That's some clarity for me. And I have the other information you've shared with me. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded. Do we need to read it all over again, Steve? Or just have vote? It. I can try if you want. What do you say? Just repeat it and then we'll vote. Because it. it's been okay. moved and seconded. And amended a little bit. And amended a little bit. <laughs> Uh, the Board of Health authorizes Interim Health Director Jennifer Brown as agent of the board to develop a mask order for indoor public spaces in Amherst to go into effect August 18, 2021, and to modify the order as needed. Develop an issue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you have to issue the order. You have to get it out there. I actually forgot the phrase <clears throat> as outlined <laughs> as outlined during the August 12th board meeting. Good. I think that thanks. works. Okay, do you need that repeated at all, Jen, or you have it okay? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think I have it, but I look forward to Steve's notes. So. I'll send I'll send you the email okay. right after the meeting as <laughs> to the wording we got. Okay. Yeah. And you know, Good. just a note, thank you everybody that's chimed in and helped. You know, it's really Whoops. been Wait a minute, I see one other hand okay. here. Uh, Should we do it? Let's, okay. let's vote on okay. it first, though. Let's vote on it. Okay. Okay. So, all in favor? Yeah. Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay, so it's been moved and passed. Now we have Peter. Uh, let's see. I can no, it's not Peter. There's it's two. Rasif. Peter's hands up again. Okay, and Rasif. Okay, Ra Rasif, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can every, everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rasif Rafiq. I'm a, a restaurant owner of uh, Bistro Sixty Three in downtown Amherst. Um, I uh, appreciate uh, the meeting today to make sure that our town is safe uh, and you know, so everything that the town has done uh, for us restaurants, businesses, community members. Um, as we go into a, the uh, fall of 2021, welcoming all, all these students into town, I think uh, this is definitely wise uh, to uh, put something in effect to make sure that the community remains uh, safe. Uh, I'm just looking for some clarification here. We usually do a, a quite a few uh, rounds of hiring and uh, sort of restructuring our hours as we go into the fall uh, to see if I can get any details of the indoor ma mask mandate. And I, I think I may have missed the earlier part of this meeting, so I apologize if it has to be repeated. But, um, you know, of course, uh, we have people inside eating, drinking, um, you know, there's different spaces, uh, a bar space, seat seating space. So have any details been discussed as far as um, what the exceptions are for when people um, are able to remove their masks to eat, um, drink, so on and uh, so forth. And if there are certain spaces um, that they can do that in or, or, or you know, that they cannot do that in, um, any occupancy limits uh, or any, anything like that. Okay. Jen, do you wanna read what you have put together? Yeah, yeah, so I have sort of some messy notes, but thank you so much for asking and I hope I can clarify. So yeah, we really wanted to, to again say that we know this is serious, but we really want to be thoughtful about what, what we're doing here. So the wording, and I kind of like this wording, and this is used in some other um, uh, uh, municipalities, persons seated at a table at a restaurant or seated at a bar eating or drinking can be unmasked. If there's a patron standing behind uh, the bar, for example, one deep, two deep, they need to be masked up. Um, five years or younger do not need to be masked. I don't know if uh, you have entertainers, but singing or woodwind or brass instruments 
they can be unmasked, but there needs to be a 10 foot setback. Um, and then the other thing we, we said, you may have heard at the end is that we're really, um, boy, there's some rumbles, excuse me. <laughs> Looking at the metrics, um, we want it to have um, a, a thoughtful data-driven process. So every two weeks, we're gonna take a look at this and we'll decide when, when the, um, this order will be rescinded. So I'm not sure if I touched on everything. There was something else about the mask really being snugly uh, fitted over your nose, over your mouth. Um, did that answer your question? Yes, it did answer my question. Thank you for that. And uh, I just have two follow-up questions. Oh. Follow-up <laughs> questions are, you know, we have uh, uh, an event room here where we have rehearsal dinners, uh, private events, things like that, that they have dance floors. Are dance floors allowed as long as um, masks are uh, worn on dance floors is the first question. And the second question is, as far as following those metrics, um, you know, are we uh, looking specifically at number of cases or hospitalizations? Um, and um, whatever the answer to that question is, is that, a, is that a CDC guideline, a state guideline that we're following or a local one that um, we are uh, uh, taking on? Yeah, so I, I think I can answer some of those and some of those I could say, I'm not sure. Um, one thing we wanna make sure is that we're really still requiring people to be thoughtful about the six feet distance. You know, this is nothing saying that we're gonna reduce or eliminate that. We're not looking at density. Um, dancing can be done, um, you know, if people keeping their distance between people, they, they're not in their parties, masks must be worn. Um, you know, fitness clubs, masks are one, worn during all types of exercise, even if it's rigorous. And the metrics are to be decided, but I like what you said and what we're gonna include. So we're looking at case, case numbers, kind of trends, um, bed availability, the other thing that we talked about um, was uh, the number of people who are vaccinated. As that goes up, that will help um, some of our, our, our spread or our transmission. So it's to be determined, the, the metrics. Um, but, but that'll be something that I'll compile. Um, and I, I forget the words that, that Peter used, but you know it's not going to be arbitrary. We're giving this a lot of thought, um, but we don't want to be bouncing back and forth. Master on, master off. Make it, make it simple and smart. Got it. So there is a six feet distance between groups that's going into effect along with this mass mandate? No, that's not a mandate. You know, it's just these are the, these are the tools that we have. You know, the, the other things we have, vaccination and testing. Then we have these other non-pharmaceutical interventions that we've all been using since then. So what if, you know, whatever you've been doing, um, Oh, you know what? Yeah, you know what? So I want to apologize. I'm thinking from a contact tracing point of view. So whatever you've been doing um, will stay. The only thing that's changing is the mask mandate. So Got I it. apologize. I'm just thinking like I've been doing the contact tracing and I have six feet in my mind. So that was an error. Got it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking okay. the time to explain that. And uh taking into consideration how it'll affect businesses and the community as well. I understand it's a, it's a balancing act. So I, I appreciate um, everyone here. Thank you. Hey, can I just add that, um, you know, in working with the, the bid, you know, they're wonderful to work with and they're gonna be really good partners with us. And I hope, I know they're good partners with you, but we have some like complimentary masks if you need them to get going and we'll help with signage. That's, okay, that'll you. be great. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. And now Peter has his hand raised again. Okay, Peter. Yes, I'll be, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll be really brief. Uh, this was just a really quick follow-up to my first comment. Um, this was just a recommendation and I don't even know how much authority the Board of Health or Jennifer would have over them, um, but it did just come to mind, especially with students coming back into town um, and how close the town of Hadley is to Amherst. I mean, it's, it's, they, you know, feed into each other and a lot of the shopping that takes place, uh, you know, among people in Amherst, especially college students and really, you know, uh, Amherst residents in general is through Hadley. Um, so this is more just sort of a recommendation or a suggestion. I don't know what type of relationship the board of health has or Jennifer or even representative Mindy Dom, because I know they're in the meeting here with uh, representatives at Hadley, 
Um, but I would just strongly recommend to reach out to them and to implore, you know, strongly suggest or encourage or help them uh, develop some type of mandate. Cause that will really, you know, if we get this in place in Northampton, Hadley, Amherst, right. Cause you know, we're, it's all connected. Right. So if we have, you know, if we have similar guidelines, it's going to help everybody out. So uh, thank you. Just a, a recommendation and suggestion. That's a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any other comments on masks? Okay, given that, we'll move over to testing. Jen, are you prepared to cover testing? I'm gonna tell you or what- Or contact tracing, uh, testing and contact tracing. Oh should, yeah, yeah, that's contact I, I should separate that. I know. Um, so, uh, so testing, you know, I wanna just say, um, you know, from a health point of view, never miss an opportunity to test. Um, our partner UMass has the testing sites open. It's, I believe, Monday through Thursday. Um, I don't have the times in front of me, but it's very easy to Google. It's right there on the site. I'm not sure how their testing is going to continue, but it's, it's there. Um, so I'm just, let's not, you know, sort of, I don't want to say slack off on that. Um, so that's there, the testing. Um, also, I just wanted to say here in the health department, um, the Department of Public Health has offered the local boards of health the um, availability of the Abbott Binex Now, the antigen rapid tests. So we applied for it uh, Monday, did a CLIA waiver. We have a doctor's order, thank you very much. Um, we're putting together a policy and procedure and standards and training and we actually received the kits today, which was pretty exciting. Huh. So we have 80 kits um, and I'm just thrilled. I've just loved thinking about antigen tests as a public health tool. Um, how we use them is to be seen. Um, we're gonna figure out what we're gonna be doing with testing, but I'd like to figure out how we can incorporate this, um, helping um, the town uh, departments, the fire department with student course perhaps. Um, and then what kind of testing can we do in the community? So it's not gonna be symptomatic testing, but it would be asymptomatic testing. So maybe if a restaurant, there was someone you know, who was exposed and, and can we do testing for them? So that's something that's new to us and pretty exciting at this phase of the pandemic. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, so that's testing. Questions? Anybody have questions? Steve, Maureen? No, public? I haven't had a chance to look at the, the protocols that the state put out for the testing, you know, the actual testing. And then the, there are some guidelines on how to use uh, the purpose or use of antigen testing versus the PCR, the, the, um, PCR testing. Yeah. Um, at the DPH website. It, and it, it is a work in progress to figure out what the role of this kind of test would be, but it, it seems like another tool to have. Yes, yeah, no, well said. And that's gonna be a big project of mine is you know, a policy and procedure and SOC. Yeah. So I'm gonna have a, a notebook that's gonna be on our shared <laughs> drive. You know, what's the procedure? There's gonna be training. Then if someone wants it, you know, what kind of documentation? And then I have to report the results that goes in to the state. If we have a positive, what's our procedure gonna be? So that's really exciting. I'm really excited about this. Mm -hmm. So that's for um, testing. That's all I have. If anyone has any questions. And um, vaccinations. Yeah, so I can't, tell you how what a great job uh, Emma Dragon did with our vaccine clinics here. You know, we've done clinics, um, <clears throat> you know, as a, as a health department, but boy, she came in and she got us on prep mod, she got us on collar. She, we did, you know, 13,000 vaccines. So I'm just, thank you to her. I just am so proud of what we did there. So where are we going with our testing here? You know, we're sort of in this different phase. So, you know, we're here in the health department. I've been in this interim for two weeks. 
what are we looking like? Uh, what are we thinking about for the fall coming up? So these are some ideas. I don't know how, whether it's gonna go, but as we get Pfizer vaccine, we're gonna be able to get it in smaller quantities. Before we were getting 1200 doses from Northampton, our partner. Now we can directly order it from the state. So that means I can log into the Massachusetts Immunization Information System and order 60 doses. So that's incredible to have that. What does that mean? Maybe here in the Bang Center, this is what I'm thinking, that we'll have vaccine clinics, maybe from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Wednesday, and we'll be there. Um, then the other thing is that we see from our data, who are we not reaching? So what can we do? Who are our partners that we can draw in that we can really reach folks who haven't been at, had access to the vaccine? And access means so many things. They weren't um, able to understand the, the information. It wasn't in their language. It wasn't um, available geographically or the timing. What can we do? Can we go to churches? Can we go to back to the survival center, you know, a great part or center for new Americans? Who can we bring in? Also, you know, what are they thinking um, <clears throat> for opening up the uh, Pfizer EUA? So it's an emergency authorization. The FDA is talking about making or, or saying that it's, it's good to go as a regular vaccine. What does that mean? Will it be dispersed into doctor's offices? I don't know. Will it be opened up for uh, younger people? So can we open up test uh, vaccination uh, for younger age groups? So we're willing to get back into the game and it's just gonna be a little bit differently configured, but I'm looking forward to keeping the program going. So question. Steve. Yeah, once you have the 60 doses, how quickly do you have to use them? Do you know? It's supposed to be within 30 days. Yeah. So oh, thanks for right. asking. Yeah. So, and the refrigerator, we can freeze it for two weeks, I think it is, and refrigerate it now for 30 days. If I'm getting that correct, I'll, I'll check. I used There's to a window, the larger window than the five days that they had at the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I want to be thoughtful about our clinics, not just spread them out. Um, but also that means it can be kind of peppered with um, folks just calling me up. We have this really nice outer room here. People can call up and say, hey, listen, it's been hard for me. Can I come in right now? It's like, yeah, come in. You know, I have office time. Or do I need office time that people can just trickle in? So we'll figure it out. But I, I sort of like the idea of something here in the bangs and then really doing some outreach, bringing our partners in and figuring out how to do that. And I think, you know, if you need volunteers, I think there are a lot of people who are still willing to help do that. Will you vaccinate, Maureen? Will you come back? I would, and I know a whole lot of other people. That whole crew that, that was showing up through the winter and the, yeah. through the spring, I think, you know, if it is, so, yeah. So if the, it's a little different, I know it's a little different with this, but I think, there people would be helpful. Yeah, no, but, and that's a good point. So we're compiling the volunteer list. We're putting that back together and taking a look at that. And we'll be emailing folks out. Um, mm -hmm. We used to go through the MRC. I'm not sure where we stand with that, but we'll look at our training. I think we need to revamp the training, mm -hmm. make sure that um, I see people's licenses, I, you know, in here. Um, there's really good CDC training um, that people can do and get a certificate. Maybe we need to have a, a training here in-house before people actually set foot through the yeah. door so they're comfortable. Because um, we sort of had a joke, we have government issue um, supplies. So let's go through all the supplies so people can pick them up and look at them kind of thing. But that's something I understand that we, we can do better. Steve, do you have any questions? Oh, sounds good. Does any of the attendees have any questions? No. Because we're on COVID, um, is there anything else that you have to report on COVID-19 update? Do you see Mindy, I think, raised her hand. Just uh, sorry, Mindy. Didn't well, I'm, see I'm, I'm, I thank you for even like calling on us and including the public. <laughs> 
conversation. Um, I just also wanted to, and I know Jen knows this and I think she said it, but I lost a little power there myself. Um, I'm also trying to remind people that the community testing and community vaccination, both of which are free and are right now still available on a walk-in basis at UMass Amherst is still available. And from what I understand, will continue to be available at least through September and probably beyond, but definitely through September. So that's not to take away from the town um, vaccinating or the town being able to provide testing, but I just like to make sure that people realize that there's also community vaccination and community testing still available at UMass Amherst. Yeah, th thank you, Mindy. I, I appreciate that. I know we mentioned the, the testing, but I didn't the vac vaccination. They do such a great job there. You know, Ann Becker is she's leading a great team there. And I really want people to understand uh, what an important place, source of, of, of uh, uh, vaccines and testing, yeah. And, and the more folks use it, um, not to, at the detriment of not using local services, but just the more people know about it and are able to use it, the more justification we legislators have to insist that it continue. So, oh, thanks. yeah, smart. Yeah. Yes. Mindy, do you know how they're um, advertising this or getting the word out to the public? Um, I don't know if UMass is doing more. Right now, I think UMass is really focusing on how they're getting the word out to the incoming population. I know I've been promoting it on my social media and in my e-news. Um, I think there was an article in the Gazette this week yep. about the testing sites continuing. So I think the location may change, like test the, the community part of testing, which is currently at the Mullen Center and has been there since it started, that may move to the campus center, but that hasn't happened yet. So maybe when the location changes, there'll be more press around um, what you can get at the campus center. Did that answer your question, Nancy? Yes, and also the, uh, the vaccine clinic. Um, yes. I don't know how widely um, that information is going out. So important. I mean, a lot of people know they can still go to pharmacies and get it on a walk-in basis. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really critical that people know you can also get it for free at UMass and when you go, since it's at the campus center, you, you might have to park your car in the garage. They give you a ticket so that you don't have to pay for parking. Um, mm -hmm. So part, everything about it is free. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just uh, uh, to say that, um, you know, we here we are talking about a mass mandate for businesses. Um, working with the bid, we uh, have a good partnership. We're starting back up again and looking to help um, anyone in businesses um, to be vaccinated. So either restaurant workers can, um, or managers or owners can, can contact the bid and they can contact us, but we'll figure that out. But I just wanted to say that was a really important partner that we have. Mm -hmm. Anything else before we go back? Anything else you need to say, more, uh, Maureen? You, you're, you lit up, Maureen, so that's why I asked you. Jennifer. I made a little noise, I think, yes. on my like, double papers. No, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for all the support and the hard work and our community members really you know, looking out for our, all our residents, so thank you. Okay. Um, Let's go back to um, Board of Health member appointment. I know we talked about it and, and you initiated the movement forward on that. Jen, do you want to just report on that? Yeah, you know, I just know that we touched base with the town hall to see um, Board of Health um, if there are applicants, and I believe there were four, and I think two were maybe a bit older, but I think we're going to be interviewing. Um, and that's uh, something that will be happening, I think, in the next few weeks. Um, we'd like to see that, that seat filled um, during this transition time, during this last uh, mile of the pandemic. Let's get some, somebody in there and uh, we'll, we'll start the interviews. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned transition. Do you want to touch on transition? Um, now? Yeah, you know, I know that the um, 
the Dragon left her position um, in July and I'm the public health and the acting director. There's an internal posting and the posting for um, a replacement has gone out. And uh, I don't know who's on the interview team, but that process will start. Um, I don't know how long it takes. I guess it depends on applicants, um, but I can keep people updated at the next Board of Health meeting what's, what's gone on. Okay, thank you. And we will back up um, to, what's my agenda here? Uh, racism. That's on old business. So I know Steve put forward a piece. The town council has a piece. And um, I had uh, submitted a piece on um, racism. We're looking at it as a public health crisis. Steve, do you well, want to? Well, the, what was the town that? Oh, the town council's general statement on racism. Yeah, yeah it wasn't really about uh, health aspects. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it if you say that's my draft or something, then I'm guilty of plagiarism because all the ideas came from <laughs> what uh, Nancy originally uh, drafted. It's really just you know, the format. And, you know, I don't know how important that is to people. I, I sort of feel like we use a certain format for regulations all the time. And I guess maybe even for this, um, I don't know how you're gonna write it, Jen, but maybe you'll say, whereas the, you know, there's been an increase and in stuff like that. You, you may write it that way with whereas, whereas, whereas. It seems perfectly right to do that for a regulation. But I just thought maybe we should, if we, if the intended readership, if people, if we're, if we're gonna really try to get people to read this thing, I just felt it would be better to put it in a direct, plain language statement. That's just how I felt. And also the other thing is, I don't know, it's just a personal thing, but if I sign something with my signature and it's out there forever signed by Steve George, I really want to agree with every little bit of it as, if possible. I can vote for things based on general agreement and uh, I don't ha have any background in public health. So often I depend on the other members and I know you're very expert. So I sometimes I go along with things I don't know, but when I'm signing it, I really feel I would like to stand for exactly what it says and the way it says it. And I'm more comfortable with a simple plain language statement. And also, as I pointed out, the if we're trying to sort of go along with what the APHA wants, the American Public Health Association, they list all the uh, towns and cities in Massachusetts that have issued what they call a declaration on racism. But among those are some that are very vague and just the, the kind of vaguest, simple couple of sentences they were working on this. So to have a plain language statement is not inconsistent with what the APHA wants out of us, I believe. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think I feel strongly one way or the other about the structure. Um, I guess when, when we talked about it last at the last meeting, my thought was we didn't think we were in the position to make the declaration, but we were going to recommend that the town council or the town make that declaration. Um, so I don't know if that's what this, this looks more like a declaration to me than a recommendation to the town council to make the yes. declaration. Yeah. But I, I don't know what, what people, if that's still what people are thinking. Yeah. I did have a conversation with one town councilor who was actually the liaison to our board, and I think he felt that this is something, since the town council has already issued a very specific lengthy declaration on racism, that we would try to, it would be fine if we did one that was separate and focusing on the health aspects, and it might well be that they would specifically endorse it, that, uh, that sort of thing, but that okay. doesn't, we're not writing it for them. We should do this because we're the people that supposedly are involved with health. Right. So the scope of the recommendations then should also maybe be what we can do. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, well, that, it, it sort of sh slip shifts it slightly for me. Yeah, that's a question. Maybe Nancy, like, who is this for? 
is this is certain it's for us telling us you know we're it's certainly not a substitute for actions but it's sort of saying what actions we should be taking but who else is it for is it for people who might disagree maybe some people i'm sure there are people that say oh yeah racism was a terrible problem in the past but we we've, we've passed all that now you know we have laws against it and so we're there is no racism now somebody might say and so those people i would hope we would be addressing and saying no but wait a second now it's not that simple there's there's issues here you have to deal with and is that what you're thinking about the general public the public of amherst people who disagree who is it for who, who do you want to read this thing Steve, you brought out a, an excellent point. And um, I, I think you clarified a lot of things. I, I believe that as um, a board of health, we have to address it as a public health crisis. And, um, and then we can give information to the town councilors for possible action, but that we, make a public statement that we believe racism is a public health crisis. Does that, is that what you were trying to say um, in, 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 your, uh, in your draft? Yes, and I, I did have some questions about calling it a crisis just because as I said, it's been going on for 500 mm -hmm. years in this part of the world. And the, you know it's not worse now, I don't think, than it has been at other times during that five hundred years. Um, so you know the crisis usually has a certain meaning, and so I was just saying, um, calling it a matter of concern, or uh, I forget what the other words were. But um, I did have a question about whether we use the word crisis in the way that it, the dictionary says it, it's to be. If used. if you look at the uh, American Public Health, whoops, I know they say that. They put it as the, the American Public Health Association has called it a public health crisis. Yes, but the question is, what do we call it? That's what we're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the AMA doesn't call it a crisis in their statement. Um, but we can call it a crisis if everybody feels it should be a crisis. Okay, we'll call it that. It's a 500 year old crisis. That has not <laughs> improved. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I I don't want to really get hung up on this. Yeah. Shall we just? Um, what are are your feelings? Um, I, I think it's important that we make a statement that goes out. Yes. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, we should definitely, I think Timothy's going to have to be involved in this for sure. He couldn't mm -hmm. be here today, but yeah. The other thing, I think one in the, in the drafts, we got a little hung up about footnotes or citations. And I have to say, when I looked at all the ones in the state, I didn't see a single one that had uh, any um, like footnotes or citations. So I, I you know, just, just yeah. FYI, I guess, I don't know. Which, uh, ones, which ones, Maureen, which ones didn't have citations? I didn't see any with. Oh, the ones from the state of other- Yeah, state. I just looked at the statements from the different yes. towns and cities uh, yes. that put right, out a right. statement. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think it to have, to know that what we're saying is correct, I think is really yeah. important. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, drawing on other sources for that information is, has, has been incredibly helpful. It's very hard to get. You, you want to have data so that you can, if you're making changes, you can see that, that those things change and they are, you know, that your interventions are making a difference. Um, that data is, for, at a hyper-local level, is very hard to come by. Um, and... You know, the, it, I don't know. That's that's neither here nor there, probably. But I, I don't want to get us, get us hung up on citations. I guess yeah. is what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, maybe you know what we could do. You know, I agree that for, in terms of the statement itself, it is kind of off-putting to have all that. So, how about you know just where we, if we do make a statement without citations, we could just put that list of citations resources on the or something. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah that'd, that'd be fine. Yeah, we don't have to have footnoted. Everything has to be footnoted. Yeah. But I thought it is important for us to say we're not just taking somebody's word for it. We have some pretty original sources there. I like those deeds from the regist registry of deeds showing sure. that the property, one of which is abuts mine, 
uh -huh. had a had a had a, 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 a requirement or a limitation that it could not be sold or mm. rented to colored people. That's from Amherst in the mid 20th century. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's really gets home, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, your opening sentence, Steve, nicely says it that the Board of Health recognizes that racism, including unconscious and system systemic racism is a threat to public health. Yeah, that, that's right, yeah. One thing that I noticed, and it's hard to find, I was looking for citations for this, but that fact that Racism not only worsens the conditions like the social determinants of health, but in itself has effects on health disparities by whether it raises people's cortisol or, you know, we don't, we don't know, but even just correcting for social economic class education, there are still disparities in health outcomes yeah. just based on race. I think that shows up in maternal uh, perinatal, like maternal mortality, like it, uh, and in that's pretty well documented. Mm -hmm. But I could find it about education. I couldn't find this. I thought I read somewhere about an economic class as well. But I think that that it's it is a cause of some of the social determinants of health in terms of employment and the poverty and education but it in itself has an effect. So you could be, you know, a well-to-do professor at, you know, Amherst College and still suffer some of this effects of racism on your health. Good point. Yes, Maureen, and I think it comes out of maternal child literature. Yeah, it does. Because you remember specifically where they were, where they were talking about a black lawyer who was pregnant and, mm -hmm and the low birth rate and it was the cortisol and it was all the other stress of, of you know, having to succeed in school and in law school and- And, and sort of navigate and, the world as a black yes. person. Yes, yes, but I-, I So I just would add, I didn't see that as explicitly and uh -huh. I think that is important. And it was many years ago and it was through the American Public Health Association and I went to some presentations yeah, um, where it was presented, but I, 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 that's I did find I a reference remember. for education levels that that was, um, but I didn't find the socioeconomic class. I think there's more to it than that, but I, it, it was hard for me to dig it up. Yeah, I can try and look in, in some maternal child um, health yeah. literature. Yeah, but that would be an, an addition. I think both you know, really covered the important areas that we wanted to just, you know, to bring out and, and the action steps. I, I, you know, I think that that's an important section of, of that. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested in the action steps. Yes. And the, like the community health assessment, trying to, staff the health department appropriately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those. Um, Evaluating our policies and procedures. Yeah, yeah. who benefits, who's harmed, mm -hmm. who influences, yeah. who decides, yeah. I thought that was very well done, Steve. Yeah. So I don't know what we want to do today with this. Um, Um, oh, I see Anita Saro's hand is raised. Okay, Anita, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I, I, just a, a couple of thoughts. I think I spoke up at the last meeting and, and mentioned that I had been involved in um, helping to draft a part of the reparations report 
uh, that was submitted to the town a little while back. And it included um, the, the part that I worked on was, was on health specifically. And certainly it was specific to people of African descent, but it could certainly, there, uh, there is uh, supportive um, data out there that expands it to to other minorities as well, and 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 to emphasize the the point that that uh, was just mentioned about race alone being a determinant. It uh, there there is a body of uh, peer reviewed data that talks in terms of cortisol levels, uh, stressors, and that leads not just to the horrible uh, data we have on maternal mm -hmm. child health, but also to contributing to chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease and, and all the other things that inflict on people. So I, I appreciate that um, all of you are looking at that, and I I really appreciate that you're you're lifting up racism um, as an issue, uh, a public health issue, and whether we call it a crisis or a threat or a concern. What's important is that the board of health ha has this as as a point of view and as a concern, so that whether there are specific actions that the board takes or whether it's, it's just something that's always part of everyone's thinking that as you go forward and look at a program and uh, just as Jennifer has been talking about vaccines and testing and you know how it affects all the different aspects of our community, just having that lens as a board of health, I think is is so critical, and I I really appreciate your taking this up. So thank you. I see it as an extension of the work around reparations, around reparative justice, that is going to um, be to the benefit of 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 everyone in the community. So thank you again. Thank you, Anita. By any Thanks. chance, do you have those references that you could share with us? Uh, just about all the references are in the reparations report. Okay, <laughs> okay. we have to and, take a close um, look at you that. You know, a, a lot of stuff wound up on the cutting room floor, so I'm happy to, to share some additional information. But, but that aspect of, of racial disparity came out even from uh, the Cooley Dickinson Community Health needs assessment that was done in a um, couple of years ago. So yeah. even then it was apparent. Thank you. you know, I consulted with Anita and she gave me some, um, pointed to some of the information that I use. So thank you very much, Anita. Sure, anytime. Any other further discussion? I don't see any other hands raised. Um, where would you like to go with this, Steve, Maureen? Um, I have it for our next well, meeting. Yeah, I mean, I think Tim has to be here for sure yeah. when we really finally discuss this. But this, that, this point is something that we can work on. I mean, just yeah. one sentence saying that it, part of the social determinants of health, it's very significant, but then it, there's a direct effect of racism itself. And that's a point we should certainly make just in yeah. one sentence someplace. Mm -hmm. And so let's work on that for next time. And then um, if we're, are we okay with the idea of a, of a statement that doesn't, isn't broken down like whereas, whereas, and Yes, very yeah, much. I, am okay. very much. Well, I agree, Steve. It's very well done. I just did that. Whereas, yeah, 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 yeah. 24 yeah. hours after, um, but I really liked how you worked yeah. on it. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. the, the, the whereas is exactly what we should do for 
all regulations and stuff like that for sure. Okay, well that's that's very useful. So how about you know if anybody comes up with a, a, a specific reference, not that we're going to necessarily have all the footnotes, but right, for but ourselves, maybe to have it in I yes a resource should. at the back or you know it, it correct something like that. Yes. Okay. So, so we can all look at that for next time. And then I, I think in that case, we're sort of ready to go. I mean, mm -hmm. if we give, if we tell Kit, Tim that this is the general direction in terms of format that we're hoping to use and see if he would agree with the, with the statement. And maybe if people have, you know, focus a little more on this one draft and maybe yeah, yeah. make some minor, some, some additions or changes um, yes. or ask questions about certain words and things like that. Um, we can, share that out there and and then we'll all be able to look at it to it again next month good okay and should i send out another should i send it out again or does everybody have i think there's only one version but maybe I'll yeah i it. have that version but if um do you want to um i have the uh reparations um yeah i have that i have that, I have that too yeah yeah do you want to just see if you can move anything else into that to support um the direct effect of uh, of racism yeah. mm -hmm. uh, a sentence we'll check that yeah yeah we maybe we can all try to figure that out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But thank you steve for all that work it was very oh, no yeah. problem no problem okay okay yeah good um i don't and see you nancy that. you got the ball rolling on that <laughs> yeah absolutely but this is entirely that's all of it came from there from that original thing um i don't see any attendees who might want to add anything to it with hands raised and lauren mills who was in our last meeting who this was a who brought it up who this mm -hmm. is a yes. for, um, it, it is not attending um okay so given that we are at 6 46 i think we'll move uh listening session to our September meeting and um, uh, there are no other topics um, anticipated by the chair uh, did we cover everything you want to have covered Jen I'd like to add two things please um, mm -hmm. one is um, our cooling center is open here at the Banks Community Center um, we opened Wednesday and it's going through Friday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I want to thank the Amherst Fire Department. That's their show. They're doing a great job. Um, I think that's something that, uh, you know, with climate change, we need to start thinking about how are we going to, you know, be looking, addressing these kind of uh, climate change, uh, you know, scenarios, heat, you know, <coughs> cold, how are we going to help vulnerable populations to a cooling center? You know, I'm just, so it's just something on my mind. So Jen, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I just have a question. How does the cooling session uh, get initiated? Do you know yeah, the process? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good question. I think we were asking that. So no, I don't think there's like a, a heat index for, uh, you know, so many days. Um, anticipated, but you know what? I'm going to say I don't know the answer to that. So, and is this initiated by the fire department? Do you have input, or who initiates it? Um, so you know it's collaborative, but um, but you know I'll I'll confirm that and sort of figure out how it's going to go okay. forward. I know they do sure. a nice job. I went down there. Oh, and um, it was um, staffed in part by the COVID ambassadors who are continuing on. I, I know you would ask about that. So. There wouldn't be a role for them in the mask business, do you? I don't suppose, because it's all inside. You don't want them going into restaurants, obviously. I don't know their role. I know they continue yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then any other thing with the cooling center? No, um, thank you. OK, thanks. And then the second thing is I want to talk about mosquitoes. And the arborvirus results summary is looking pretty good, I have to say. Um, so what I took off DPH today, they've sampled, um, uh, they're sampling mosquitoes. 38 mosquito samples have tested positive for West Nile. 
zero animals, zero human positive cases. No triple E has been detected in mosquitoes. That means that Amherst is in a low risk category, but low risk still means there's actions we should be taking. Um, so just, you know, something that the health department were thinking about how they get the word out. There's some events coming up. So what kind of outreach we can do. Um, low risk, you know, know your risk, repair screens, dump out water, mm -hmm. um, wear repellent if you, if you choose to, dust to dawn is, you know, where are you, long sleeves. So anyhow, that's what I wanted to say. Um, you know, we're in the cycle that this potentially could be heightened uh, risk uh, or, or heightened mosquitoes carrying triple E this year. But so far, knock on wood. Um, we're not there yet, but we know it gets ramped up this time of year. So. Yeah, as we move into August and into September. Now, I have a question, Jen, that you more than likely don't have the answer to. But when the, when the, when the high school goes back, are they going to be having sports teams? And will those uh, teams be playing as we go into dusk and um, we should probably look into educating them, um, but I know, I'm sure you don't have all those answers. Yeah, no, um, no, right. I don't have that answer, but I like your thinking, you know, what can we do education-wise because we want to stay on, in front of this. Mm -hmm. But so far, knock on wood, it looks good. Um, but but I agree that education piece, let's include the schools, you know, that, yeah, again, they're, they're great partners. And they may not, with the Delta variant, they might not be having sports teams playing, although they did in the spring, they I don't do. know what they're going to yeah, do in the I fall. Guess they will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if that was one thing that happened in the spring, if, even yeah. when school wasn't in session, yeah. they had their sports teams playing. Um, but it's, it's outside. I mean, that's part, or at least the outside, outdoor sports, and that's where the mosquitoes are. So, yes. Yeah, yeah especially I mean, those, setting, those yeah. fields that go towards the, the, the trees. Um, uh, that whole area by the high school. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Jen? No, just another big thank you to everybody. You know, just the last DPH call I was on, you know, these, these leaders at the state are saying thank you to everyone. It's just been a long, tough time, you know, and I just appreciate all the work everyone's doing together. So thank and you. I want to thank you for, yeah. for stepping in once again. It's a good team. Yep. <laughs> Nina. Okay. So thank your team. I will. That's it for me. Thank you. If there's nothing else. Thursday, September 10th, second Thursday. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Steve. You're always on the calendar. <laughs> 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 um, and can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll move that. Yep. Actually, is it September 9th? Yeah. What? Oh, did I, did I look at the wrong one? I think it's September 9th. Okay, That's sorry. I, I might have been looking at the wrong year on my yep. screen there. Okay. Thursday, okay. September, 9th. September 9th. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Just was putting it in my calendar and I. Yeah. Thought, yeah. I know. While I'm at it. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so, uh, September 9th is our next meeting. Steve made a motion to adjourn. May have it seconded. seconded. All in favor? Maureen? Aye. Steve? Aye. And myself, aye. And thank you, um, everybody, once again. Okay. Good Take night, care. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So long. <laughs>